I'd like to show you magic. Where everyone else would perish, a man who cannot die with electricity. Not me, someone else. This man is called Mohan, simple man from India. He can pass huge amounts of electricity through his body to turn on a lamp or a mixer without a problem. Truly, there can be magic in the world. But alas, this is not one of them. This is BS as F. Thanks for watching. What? Do you want me to add anything to this? This is absolutely fake. I do like to believe in magic, but there is not a single creature in the universe that can pass this amount and form of electricity through their body and survive. This guy is called the current Mohan, but I call him with his superpower, the superconductor, meaning zero resistance. He is interviewed by this guy. My name is Daniel Browning Smith. Who is a kindergarten dropout with flexible superpowers on f***ing history channel. Shouldn't knowledge channels be in the business of spreading f***ing knowledge? Electricity Mohan, so you are real. <laughs> Here is how much Dan knows about electricity. I've studied electricity, and I know if you touch a live wire, the current will flow through your body. And here is how well he checks things. It looks normal. 200 volts. Well, it looks real to me. Why do I call Mohan a superconductor? Because he's an absolute zero ohm short circuit. Just look at this. A 100 watt lamp on 220 volt AC needs around half an amp of current. The light intensity doesn't change at all, no matter where Mohan touches the wires on his body, which means he's a f***ing dead short. And the mixer needs 3 amps. It's real, it's not fake. No sir, you're dumb. Mohan is obviously doing this to attract girls. I need a meter to test the electrical resistance. <laughs> Dan wants to check Mohan's body resistance and buys a new multimeter. What was wrong with the first meter you used to measure? It was rigged, wasn't it? And now Dan discovers the obvious nail in the coffin of this myth. Why don't we test your resistance of your skin? How's that? I'll test me. Okay, you test. And then you test you, okay? Okay. And I am point. One eight. Whoa, so you're, it keeps going up. So you're like almost a million ohms. Does this mean that the flow of electricity is redirected around his body? So his heart is not directly affected by the deadly current? <laughs> so you're 10 times more resistant than me. Dan, Dan, you are more conductive than this guy. Your body resistance is 180,000 ohms, while Mohan's body is over 1 million ohms. You know that voltage is equal to resistance times current. So in order for the 3 amp current of the mixer to pass through 1 mega ohm resistance of Mohan's, we need over 3 million volts and we only have 220 volt AC. Who paid you to travel all the way there to miss this clue? I'm so sure of this. First I would touch the same wires Mohan touched and then maybe do some probing around and check his fake circuits. But that's not all. They sent a new set of idiots to do the same thing. And this time they brought an independent expert who obviously has his hand in Mohan's tricks. So I call him Culprit Fake Man. Mohan proves the current is flowing. For sakes, narrator, the tool is showing Mohan is a live wire. There is no current flowing yet. He's actually conducting electricity now through his tongue and anywhere on his body. An electric drill. It's a 500 watt drill. <laughs> the drill pulls over two amps through Mohan's body. Mohan should be dead. Okay, stop right there. I have an angle grinder and I plugged it in and I cut the wires and if I touch the wires, it turns on. <laughs> Try it again. Do you see those large sparks? Even if this guy was made of titanium, he would still have burn marks on his body. But there are no sparks. I've never seen anything like that in my life. You should get out more, man. <laughs> Electric shock causes blood pressure to plummet. But amazingly, Mohan's remains constant. Because there was no current through his body. Ah! I know this guy is fake easily because, you know, I know better. Well, I guess I have to reveal my secret now. A lot of you ask why I'm still not dead after all those shocks. Well, I have my angle grinder plugged in and I'm gonna turn it on with these wires. Okay, here we go. I've never seen anything like that in my life. No, people, stop believing in crap. I just shorted a capacitor to have the spark effect 
and I had a switch under my foot to turn on the grinder. Now I know Mohan didn't switch the power himself, and I don't think he can design a touch activated power supply. So my guess is that culprit was in another room watching when Mohan was touching the wires to his body, switching the power on and off. If you need more proof, give Mohan to me. I'll electrocute him to the moon and beyond. <laughs> Hello everybody, it's Friday! Welcome back to The Shack in Oregon. My name's Larry. The show is called Ham Radio Live. Welcome! My goodness gracious, please hit that subscribe button. We don't put attitudes in our program here. You're not going to sit there and sit those five second long waits for a product you don't want. Why do that? You can watch this show all the way from front to back and have a bad time and not pay for it. Why not just subscribe? It helps people find the channel here on YouTube. Wherever you may be, everybody, happy Friday. We're so glad you're here. What a great day today is going to be. It is February the 19th. Welcome, everybody, to the show. <laughs> the current Mohan. <laughs> oh, my. Got to thank Gunter again, Germany, for sending me uh, some of that work. If you want to see this guy's stuff, it's actually pretty funny. And understand, it is for fun. It's just a for fun thing. The guy makes a ton of money on the side doing the YouTube stuff. And he's got some sponsorships. He does well. Good for him. That's There's nothing wrong with you. Make a living. That's what you do, right? You know, but find him at Electro Boom. That's where you'll find a lot of his stuff. Electro Boom. It's great. It's awesome. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. We're going to talk a little bit about amplifiers today and remoting them to literally make your radio sit literally a, you know, whatever watt amp you want radio so instead of it being 100 watts it's going to throw out maybe a thousand could be 600 might be 15 1200 whatever but it'll track your you know your band it'll just let you go wherever you lead it pretty cool we'll talk about that today also work on the extra exam and we'll see about uh, a show tonight i hope we can do cq calling we haven't done a time in forever last week it was tough i want to thank again really nice guy um, we had a great call last night, the middle of the night for the folks that saw it. It was to Pierre Hukabun. Hukabun and, and Pierre is from a very small island called Biak in Papua. It was wonderful. I mean, Pierre is just one of the most kind and just sweet guys, just a nice guy. And you think about how many hams might be on this little island that's about the size of the island of Maui in the United States and Hawaii. So not a huge island, but Pierre was there and making the calls last night on 40 meters to give you an idea of how far that is. And yes, Thor, we need to activate the woofing filter. There, they're going again. Oh gosh. Anyway, the red, the red dot there, that's where Pierre is. The uh, blue and yellow area is where I'm at. So that was 6,800 miles. Just one moment. There we go. Wolfing filter has now been activated. <laughs> oh, we get deliveries or something to the door. Somebody walks their dog around and they're barking. They just go nuts. It's the way it is. Anyway, welcome to the show. It's great to see you guys. Let's say hello to everybody. And I just appreciate y'all being here. Andy, welcome. Good evening to you. Same with Stu in the UK. Golf 7, Whiskey Alpha Yankee. It's always a pleasure, Stu. Jim is here from Colfax, Washington. Whiskey X-Ray 7 Quebec. Jim, welcome, my Northwest pal. Good to see you, Jim. IT guy, love you, man. Kilo 6 Union India down in, the, in California. It's great to have you here as always. Thank you for coming, Joseph. Appreciate you. <laughs> it's a great comment. I need Mohan to work on my amplifier. <laughs> I don't know if you want that. Daniel, welcome back. Kilo Charlie 1, Mike Romeo Zulio, Zulu, sorry, in Manchester, New Hampshire. Just got his first HF rig. That deserves some applause. Daniel, congrats. What'd you get, man? Dish it. Tell us what you got. Excited to hear about that. That's great. Great Lakes Reliance is in the house. He's Kilo Bravo, excuse me, Kilo 8, India Bravo X-Ray. Welcome back to you, my friend. It's great to see you. I hope it's warming up your way. Man, you guys got just nailed with cold weather last week. It was terrible. So Andy says it's going okay. And uh, Great Lakes Reliance is a wing nuts rag chew group on 7.230. 
That's good. All right, the Wingnuts Reg Chew Group. Yeah, it could only happen in ham radio, right? No! <laughs> the Wingnuts Reg Chew Group. All right, Extra Fridays. It's a time when we talk about getting you help to get the extra exam. Now, let me preface this because really there's only about 3% that you get when you go for the extra, right? And so it's not really like it may seem like a big deal, but it really can be. For example, on 40 meters, it gives you all of the sideband portion for 40 if you want to use mic. That's important. There's a ton of DX between 7.128, which is the lowest part we can work in the band plan, up to 7.175. So there's a ton of DX. Last night's DX with Pierre was in that area. So give you an idea of some of the benefits you get for studying for this exam. The extra gives you everything. Now, it's going to take a lot of work. I'm not going to kid you. The technician in general, in you know summary, are, are very passable. I mean, I believe the average person can do that very well. The extra is going to take some hard study. It just does, but it's worth the study, okay? And many VEs have told me that they've seen tons of generals take the extra exam multiple times, not passing it. So keep in mind, if you don't pass it, keep trying because it's worth that extra 3%. It really is. All right, first question today on the extra. What is an undesirable effect of using too wide a filter bandwidth in the intermediate frequency section of a receiver? Okay. The problem you have when you're using too wide of a filter, and this is just basically the, the, the bandwidth, undesired signals may be heard. Okay. When you've got two people close together and you've got a bandwidth that's too wide, you can hear some of both of them. You might hear one person pretty well, and then you got another one that you're hearing the edge of. It just makes it sound worse. So make sure you set your bandwidth. You can see it on most modern transceivers. Just change the bandwidth to match the frequency that you're trying to receive. Okay. Next question on the extra, extra Fridays here on Ham Radio Live. What is the significance of a voltmeter, a voltmeter sensitivity expressed in ohms per volt? All right. The answer is A, the full scale reading of the voltmeter multiplied by its ohms per volt rating will indicate the input impedance of the voltmeter. This is a mouthful, and I know that. But again, this is what you need to learn to get the extra license, okay? There are tons of either, you know, currently employed or retired radio and television broadcast engineers who have extra licenses because, you know, they had to learn this stuff. And for them, it's easy. For a lot of us, it's hard. Here's a great question that really shows how hard it can be. Now, if you understand electrical theory, yeah, it makes sense. But if you don't, this could be a mouthful and it could be very intimidating. I want to encourage you not to be intimidated by questions like this. They can be hard, and I understand that. But truly, it's worth your effort. It is. It's worth your effort to get the extra, okay? If I can do it, you can do it. Trust me, you can. All right, next question. What type of HF propagation is probably occurring if radio signals travel along the terminator between daylight and darkness? Okay, this is what happened last night on the contact with Pierre in Biak, on Biak Island. Okay, same thing. The terminator line essentially is the area where darkness and daylight meet. Okay, it's the exact point, but it's not really, you know, we know it's not perfect. If you've ever watched a sunrise or a sunset, you know it's not perfect. Let me show you what we're talking about. Take a look here at the geochron. Okay, the terminator line is essentially this area right here. Okay, it's right where it gets dark. Okay. But you see this area, how I've got it, I've got, and this setting is on the geochron. You can make it either a very sharp terminator line where it's literally dark, light, okay? But this is more what real world is. It's where it starts to get dark right here and where the sun is starting to go up over here, all right? This is the terminator line, darkness to light. If you remember that one segment, of the test, it's going to help you tremendously because what it does is it allows you the opportunity to, to realize that really this isn't hard on this question. 
if you take a look at it carefully, right, you're going to see that really the Terminator line is simply where it's sunrise or sunset. That's it. Sorry for what's going on in the background. Don't mean that to happen to you. But it's important you understand it, okay? The Terminator line simply is sunrise or sunset. All right, next question. What type of polarization is best for ground wave pop propagation? The answer here is vertical, okay? Vertical polarization is always best for ground wave propagation, okay? And there's a reason for that, okay? Medium wave broadcasters, stay, they use generally they use vertical polarized towers because ground wave propagation over the earth is considerably better using vertical polarization, whereas horizontal polarization shows a marginal improvement for long distance communications when you use the ionosphere. So vertical polarization tends to be more efficient than horizontal if you're gonna work long distance DX. Okay, pretty much the answer. And there I am, real huge. Hi everybody, there's my big gigantic chin, sorry. <laughs> All right, next question. Let me catch up with your comments after this question, all right? Next question on the gen, on the extra, excuse me. What characterizes libration, okay? Libration fading of an EME signal. All right, first of all, libration fading, okay? And EME, what does this all mean? For people who don't understand, this could be hard, okay? EME is essentially bouncing your signals off the surface of the moon. No joke. For people that might be interested in ham radio, ham radio folks are brilliant. They, they really are. They're extremely intelligent. And they found that they can actually bounce a signal from the surface of the moon and come back onto Earth in a different place. And it works. Not, not easy to do, but it does work. So when you're talking about liberation fading of an Earth EME or moon bounce signal, what you have is a fluttery, irregular fading of the signal. It's fluttery and it's not regular, okay? And it fades. The reason it does this, by the way, I don't know if you know this, the reason it does this is because of the surface of the moon. It's not flat, okay? There are craters, there are mountains, there, there's not a whole lot of topography that's smooth. So because of that, as those signals bounce up off the lunar surface and come back down, you get that fluttery fading. That's why it happens. All right, catch up with your comments. Wow. Lots of folks here jumped in when we started. James, the station manager is back. Good job, James. What's the name of the station manager there? I got to ask you. I got to ask you that question. Yes, sir. Greg Stewart, good evening. Two whiskey, Oscar, Foxtrot, Yankee, Papa is in the house. That's an honor right there. Wow. That makes me thrilled. No joke. Thank you. I'm just like, hold on a second. Wait. I got to take a look at this because this is this is something that's pretty cool. By the way, Wingnuts Reg Chew Group. It's great. I love it. <laughs> you know, only hams could come up with something like that because it's like nobody in their right mind would call themselves a club like that, right? <laughs> Why would you? It's like, no, 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 no. The Wingnuts Reg Chew uh, Group. Fragile. Almost sounds like, yeah, kind of like that. It must be Italian. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. <sighs> yeah. All right. So anyway, thank you for coming, Greg. It's great to see you. It really is. And in fact, I want to do this real quick because I, I've tried to do this and it didn't uh, didn't take. So I'm going to do this right now because I love to find out where people are. And for me, this is just a joy to have you here. And I mean that very much. That's why I like to say a proper hello to you because you're coming from a long, long ways away. He's all the way in Wales. Greg in the UK. Thank you profoundly for coming to today's show. Thank you so much. I mean that. All right, Daniel. No, not just a G90. You got a nice Igu G90. Congratulations, man. Let's give a big old hand there for Greg. I thought for Daniel. That's great. He's got his Igu G90 currently got on. Uh, his listening antenna so he can see what local activity sounds like. Now check this out. This is a ham that wants to grow and learn. I like this. Look what he says. Currently got on my listening antenna so I can see what local activity sounds like. Going to put up a homebrew random long wire with a nine to one ballon. See how it works. Very good. You know what, Daniel? Good for you. Experiment, grow, learn. You're going to find so much more when you do this than when you learned this. There's no comparison. Doing it 
is 10 times better than learning it because you remember a lot better. I'll tell you that. Tom's here from Bahrain. Tom, welcome back. Good to see you, buddy. Hey, thanks for the nice comment, too, on the DX there to Pierre. Appreciate that. Cliff is here. Whiskey Delta 4, Oscar Bravo Papa. Cliff, an honor to see you. Lee is back. Lee Rosselli, Whiskey Alpha 8, Romeo November Bravo. Congratulations to Daniel on the G90. He has one and could be lots of fun. Give yourself a few weeks to get familiar with it. He says, once you learn all the features, it will be a joy. The antenna is so important. That's some great advice from Lee. Thank you. So appreciate that. And uh, Lee Rosselli, listen to this. Just learned of the reverse beacon network for those using Morse code. What fun helps you know how you're being heard by stations on the network? Please share info about this information with those watching. Okay. Reverse beacon network is pretty cool because it helps you to know if you're being heard by that beacon. Think of a regular beacon as one that just transmits. That's all it does. Okay. 100 watts. Remember, 100 watts, 10 watts, 1 watt, tenth of a watt. Then it does it again. Different frequency. A reverse beacon works as a listening beacon. Okay. If it hears you, it's going to transmit a signal back and it's going to repeat your signal. They're phenomenal. Lee, thank you for sharing. That's good stuff. That really is. James is in the station manager's name is Monty. He's an 11 year old border collie. Jim, that's great. Mike seven, Bravo X-ray Tango. Yeah. And my heart and prayers, please. I don't know if you'll like me to say this, but let me just say one of our regular view viewers here just had to put his dog down. And he told me about it yesterday because I'd placed a picture of where my FTDX 10 is in my living room next to my chair. And my dog Miley got in the picture. And I thought, oh, that's all right. It's Miley. It doesn't matter. But, you know, he told me that about his pup having to be put down and how much he loved him. We all love our animals so much. They're like our kids, really. And so, you know, keep, you know, I don't want to say his name because he may not be comfortable with that. But just please keep one of our viewers in your prayers because he's hurting pretty bad right now. That just happened. So tough stuff. Trucking and fun. I like that. That's a pretty cool name. Hey, everybody, no call sign yet, but testing. Second week of March, planning on taking tech, general, and extra test. Not expecting to pass the extra. Okay. First of all, I did all three. You can do that. Don't put it lightly. Just take it very seriously. What I did was I worked my rear end off, 168 hours of work. What I would do is I'd cram and cram and cram. And it wasn't about memorizing answers. It was about learning the principles. I couldn't do this show if I memorized answers. There's no way. I mean, what I just told you about the moon is not on the test. I researched things. I learned about stuff. And I don't know everything. Okay, I don't. I don't pretend to. I honestly say I don't. But the point is, you can do it. Go to zero from that. Go from zero to extra. Blow the VE's minds. It's the greatest thing in the world when you do that. Because I did it. And they were stunned. First time they'd ever see it. Now, don't be disappointed if you don't get the extra. If you come out of there with the general, you're great. If you come out with the technician, at least you're on the air. That gives you a call sign. You go back. You take the test again. So, most important thing, trucking, is just get on the air. And you're doing it, man. Congratulations to you. Good work. Good work. Keep it up. Proud of you. Sean, on the east side of the Cascades, Alpha India 7, Echo Quebec. Thank you so much. Daniel, wishing luck to trucking as well. We all do. The very best in luck to you. That's why this channel exists. That's why it's not monetized. That's why I do the goofy, goofy stuff that I do here because I'm weird naturally, but it's different. This ham radio show is very different from other ones you see. It's supposed to be because it's supposed to get to people that aren't in ham radio and tell them about our hobby so that they can learn about it. So trucking, keep up the good work. All right, we're done with the hellos for now. Let's get to the test. Extra exam. Which, which of the following is a possible reason that attempts to initiate contact with a digital station on a clear frequency are unsuccessful, okay? So in layman's terms, you're trying to make a call on digital. Say it's, I don't know, let's say you're using JT65, okay? And the station's clear, but it's not working. 
So what's going on here? Okay. There are lots of reasons for this. And, and there's some that aren't listed here. Okay. One, your transmit frequency is incorrect. Take a look at that. Okay. Two, the protocol version you're using is not supported by the digital station. Three, another station you are unable to hear is using the frequency. That's most likely what's happening. Somebody else you can't hear is contacting them from maybe a you know far away distance that you can't hear them. Okay. So all these choices are correct. Okay. Another thing, check your antenna. Make sure you're using the right antenna. Don't be on your listening antenna trying to make contacts. Good example. There are lots of reasons why it doesn't work sometimes, but there's just a sampling of why. Okay. Sometimes digital just doesn't work. The best thing I can tell you with that, stop, look at your transceiver and go through a mental checklist. Am I in the right antenna? What antenna am I using? Okay, because that's important. You're not going to want to use a receive antenna if you're trying to make transmit, right? Because you're going to blow your receive antenna up. Okay, um, what what mode am I on? That's huge. What mode am I on? And the last thing, don't give up. Just you can always try again. Okay, just because you don't get it the first time doesn't mean you quit. Next question on the extras. What do the letters in the satellite's mode designator specify? Okay, now this is like when you see UV mode, right? UV meaning UHF, VHF, okay? Uplink frequencies on one, you know, one end and the downlink frequencies on another, okay? I just give you the answer. <laughs> uplink and downlink frequency ranges. That's what it is. You're transmitting up to the satellite on one frequency and the satellite transmits back on another. Kind of like working split, but in a different way because it's really using VHF, UHF. That's really what it's doing or it's using different parts of one of the bands, okay? Next question has to do with television with ham radio. Did you know we can do that? That's pretty cool stuff, right? And it's really neat. Robbie from the channel watches that and does that. He's good at it. Which is a video standard used by the North American Fast Scan ATV stations? The answer is D N T S C. Okay, that's the video format that's used by North American Fast Scan Television. Okay, N T S C. Pretty simple. Next question. Extra Friday. What is the minimum number of qualified VEs? VE means volunteer examiners required to administer an element for amateur operator license examination. The answer is always three. There's never a reason for a fourth. Okay. There's always three. So that's the answer on every one of these. And there's lots of, you know, different questions throughout the technician general and extra that have this question in some form on it. Make sure you pick the one that has three. Okay. And understand that only people who have a license higher than the class you're testing for can be a VE for it. Okay. Technicians, you're trying for a license test. You got to have, you know, at least three generals there to be your VEs. Extra exam, got to have at least three extras there. It's the only way you can get it done. All right. Last, next question, under what circumstances might the Federal Communications Commission issue a special temporary authority to an amateur station? Okay. The answer is A, to provide for experimental amateur communications. Let's say you're developing a new way to communicate in ham radio. You want to use your radio to communicate. You're trying to develop something. You simply contact the FCC, let them know what you're doing. Okay they'll then give you a temporary permit to do so. Don't just go at your own and say, I'm the Lone Ranger. I'm going to do this myself. Here's 20 meters. Let me go and throw a 500 watt carrier out there. What do you say? We get it all done. Don't do that. Make sure you check, get your FCC approval and you'll be fine. Okay. Extra Fridays continue. Last three, which the following operating arrangements allows an FCC licensed U S citizen to operate in many European countries and alien amateurs from many European countries to operate in the U.S. All right. You know, yesterday, our, our, this, and this is a very, very good question because it came up yesterday. I don't know if you remember this, but yesterday, Tom in Bahrain brought this up because he uses this. He uses the SEPT agreement. 
The CEPT agreement really is the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administration. That's what it is. But they just call it CEPT, C-E-P-T. Radio amateur license allows U.S. amateurs to travel to and operate from most European countries without obtaining an additional license or permit. It's kind of like you show them your license and then they say, okay, they check it out and they say, you may transmit here. However, you have to use a special identifier when you do so. Take a look at Tom's. Let's look at Tom's. See that? He's got Alpha Echo 1 Tango Papa. Alpha 9-2 Golf Whiskey, okay? That's why. The second call is part of the SEPT agreement that he's using in Europe. So that's why Tom's doing that. And he's in Bahrain right now, but he's still using it there in the Middle East. Tom, you do a lot of good work, and I'm really proud of you. I want you to know that. I haven't told you that. I appreciate you coming to the channel as much as you do, and I really appreciate your kindness. Thank you. Next question on the extra. Which amateur stations may be operated under RACIS rules? RACIS is an you know, emergency group, kind of like Aries. They both work to try and help coordinate emergency communications when something badly goes wrong and there's no communications available. Okay. The answer is C. Any FCC licensed amateur station certified by the responsible civil defense organization for the area served. That's a mouthful. So what it really means is any licensed amateur that's certified by the local civil defense organization for your area. You want to find out who that is? You can do that pretty easily. All you have to do is contact ARRL. The American Radio Relay League has a list and they'll be able to tell you exactly how to find out how you can connect there and be a part of that wonderful organization. All right. Last two questions. What is the first action you should take if your digital message forwarding station inadvertently forwards a communication that violates FCC rules? Okay. You have a repeater essentially here. Okay. And Somebody is forwarding a message that violates the FCC rules. What do you do? The answer is A. Discontinue forwarding the communication as soon as you become aware of it. That's it. Okay. Once you know something's going wrong, pull the plug on it. Then you're done. That's all. It's the best you can do. There's really not much more you can do after some of that's getting out there. So stop it as soon as you can. That's really what it means. Last question on the amateur extra today. When evaluating a site with multiple transmitters operating at the same time, the operators and licensees of which transmitters are responsible for mitigating overexposure situations? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. In layman's terms, uh -huh. when you got a whole bunch of people transmitting, say on field day, Okay, and they're all in one big park. Okay, who's responsible for maybe putting too much RF out there that could hurt somebody? That's it. That's a practical example of what this is. The answer is C. Each transmitter that produces 5% or more of its maximum permissible exposure limit at accessible locations. So if you've got one of the transmitters that produces 5% or more, of an RF maximum exposure limit, okay, you could be responsible. You've got to mitigate it or pull back, okay? And the, and the reason why this is important, CA, only the most powerful transmitter. Sometimes when you get into areas where there's multiple people in a field or in a park who are transmitting, right? Some might be using 100 watts. Some could be using maybe 200 so it could be running QRP. That's why it's the way it is. That's why it's C. Because the transmitter that produces at least 5% is the one that has to slow down, pull back the reins, bring it back. Because if they don't, then everybody suffers. And you don't want that. Make sure you do it the right way. Welcome to the show. It's good to see you, everybody. Catching up on y'all. And by the way, Daniel, congratulations on getting that new rig. There's nothing better 
than getting a brand new rig. Congratulations. Dave is here from Temecula, California. Good to see you for late for class, please. Whiskey Six Charlie Radio Tango. Dave, it's so nice to see you. Thank you. Glenn Stevenson. Good evening to you, mate. It's my mate there in Australia. I work somebody north of you. How far? I got to ask you, how far is Biak Island from Australia? Do you know? I'm curious. It's just north of New Guinea. So it's like if you take Australia like this, right? It's just kind of in the center of Australia, north. But man, what a beautiful place. Tropical look, beaches. Goodness sakes. Tom says because of the SEPT agreement, his call sign is Lima Zulu Stroke Alpha Echo One Tango Papa when he's in Bulgaria. Okay. Notice that the beginning of that call sign tells basically where he's at. He's in LZ, which is Bulgaria. So LZ Stroke. Alpha Echo One Tango Papa. And that's how he would make his call. And people then know, okay, he's coming from Romania, but he's an American ham. That's it. Pretty simple stuff. Greg is here. Great to see. He's going to be taking his extra class next month. Still saving for an HF transceiver. Hope to do some DX soon. Work on that antenna and feed line first, Greg. You'll be so much happier you did. You will. Seriously. Um, man, I, you know what? I did the classic mistake of new ham. I did because all I knew before was I would just collect really high end receivers to listen to short wave and DXAM. But I, you know, and I had good antennas. I just sell them to buy my gear. Your money is so much better spent by buying an antenna first. And I know it's not sexy and cool. I get it. The radio is the big deal. And I understand that. I totally do. But don't make the mistake that I made by buying the radio first and then thinking antenna because I was backwards. And I know now how wrong that was, but it's through experience. Trust me, get the good antenna first. If you want a good one that's cheap, buy Callum's DX Commander Classic. Really, just learn how to cut the radials, learn how to cut the elements, and you're golden. If you need help with it, let me know. I built it. Mine's under 1.1 to 1 throughout. So from 8, let's see, 40 to 17. And I'm really thinking I might cut an 80 meter element for it here this weekend because I lost that when the AV680 broke. Yep. So think antenna first. All right. We're going to talk today a little bit about amplifiers and how to make your radio high power, not just 100 watts or 200 watts. No, you can make it even better. Say, for example, you got, I don't know, let's say $2,400. Okay. You won't buy this amplifier. This one's about six grand. This is the Elecraft KPA 1500. This is a great amplifier. Very well received, extremely well reviewed. Okay. You can buy it as a kit or you could have it built for you. Okay. This will set you back about six grand. It's full 1500 watt, no tune amplifier, not a tube in it, and it follows you around the bands. You have the connected cable from your rig to that, and it's going to follow you like a little puppy dog. It's pretty cool. The next one I'm going to show you real quick. Maybe you don't have that much money. Okay. Say you've got $2,400. Okay. 500 watts. Elecraft makes a 500 watt amp as well. You can do it as a kit or you can have it built for you. 500 watts follows you around exactly when you change bands. It changes bands and follows you by frequency as well. So it's about 2,400 bucks before tax to buy this Elecraft and have 500 watts. Palstar makes a fantastic amplifier. Okay, here's their LA-1K. As described, it's 1,000 watts, okay? It will do the same exact thing that the Elecrafts do by following you by band and frequency. It's gonna set you back over 4,300 bucks, okay? This is expensive, but you get a kilowatt. Not too bad. Nice looking screen on it too. Okay. So there's a kilowatt amp. Now we go to, let's see, Ameritron. Okay. Local company, MFJ. All, by the way, these companies are all in USA. Um, this is Ameritron ALS 600. Okay. And this is actually the 606S because it's the switcher. So it comes with the power supply below. And then you see, of course, the actual amplifier above. It does not use tubes. It is a solid state amp. It's going to follow you around the dial. 
going to get you wherever you are. You're on 20, it'll work 20. You're on 80, it'll switch to 80. See on the far right knob. Okay, you see that's where the frequencies are adjusted. But to the far right, there's a, there's a connection there called remote. So what it takes is it takes a little cable that you buy optionally. You can hook up from the back of your rig straight to the amplifier, and it's going to change frequencies as you go. So you're on 20. You've got a resonant antenna throughout 20 meters under 2 to 1. This is important. Stat, solid state amps should be and remain under 2 to 1. However, always still good to use an antenna tuner just in case something goes wrong. Because the antenna tuner is going to, if the big rush of SDOVR comes back down the line, that antenna tuner is going to absorb that and protect your amplifier. That's why it's important. Make sure you're running with an antenna tuner that can cover at least the wattage of the amplifier you have. That's very, very important. Okay. The uh, Ameritron ALS 600 runs you about $1,800. So there's your 600 watts out. And that's right there. That's not far away from full legal limit, believe it or not. Full legal limit in the U.S. is 1500 So you're saying 600 Well, that's not very much. It doesn't give you that much more than a 1,500-watt amplifier. Okay, But let's say you want to go all the way up to a 1,200-watt amp. Okay. Here's the one I have. This is the ALS 1306. It runs 1.2 kilowatts, 160 to 6. And it has, if you take a look at that far upper right knob, it will work remote. So that means if you get the connecting cable from your radio to this amplifier, you now have literally a 1200 watt radio. It'll follow you where you go. It will transmit right away and unkey and everything. No tuning, no tubes, no muss, no fuss. This is a really good amplifier. I'll tell you, I've had mine now since December. It's been wonderful to use. I think I've only used it at like 1100 watts a couple of times. I like to run a lot of power. What I try and do is I try and keep my power low, typically at 100 watts. But sometimes it's fun because you turn it up and then you work it. But what you find out when you use an amplifier is that people might hear you, okay, that you, but you can't hear them. They hear you because you're running a little power. You don't hear them back because they're not running enough. And it's hard because you don't want to, you know, miss calls from people and them get mad. Well, wait, I was calling you back. You were a 5.5 five to me. Well, 5.5 five to you because I'm running 1,200 watts or 1,000 watts. If you're running 100 watts back, I can't hear you. Back of the um, of 1306 looks like this. So what you do on this trans on this amplifier, first of all, notice the real big plug on the far left. That's to plug it into its own power supply. Okay, power supply on this is actually pretty darn so solid. I found it to be pretty good. Hang on, just one second. Sorry about that. The um, the power supply on this is actually pretty small, not very, not very big, goes underneath your desk, connects up on that left side. Okay. The ALS 1306, if it's for if it's wired for 220, it's gonna run 12 amps at 220. It will work though at 110. It will. It's gonna draw 25 amps though. Okay. That's a lot of amperage. This is why you want to run the ALS 1306 at 110, I'm sorry, at 220, because you're going to be pulling so much amperage out of there, there's not going to be anything else you can use, including probably your lights or your computer, where if you go to this one instead, which is the 600, yeah, sure, it's only 600 watts, and you know, at 1200, you know, you might be thinking, gosh, do I want 1200 watts? Well, this one will plug in to 110, and it only takes... 12 amps. That's the nice part. Okay. So you can use this, run 600 watts. It's highly rated. It does very well. I'll tell you, I have heard nothing but good things about the ALS 600 or 600 S. Find information about them over at Ameritron on Palstar. Contact them direct. They'll give you their information on Elecraft. Contact Elecraft direct and they'll have theirs. Amps are running out. We're running out of amplifiers right now in the U.S. I don't know if you noticed that, we're starting to see a shortage and a shipping date that's going out maybe a month or two now because they're just having a hard time keeping them in stock because their supply coming in has slowed down so much. Same with antenna products, same with transceivers. That's why so many companies are out of rigs right now. The supply in has slowed down tremendously.
absolutely tremendous thing. All right, connecting with your comments. Oh, by the way, I want to show you real quick this. This is one thing I did want to show you as part of the show. All right, voice is going out. This nasty thing. All right, so I'm going to show you on a split screen how this will work, okay? And I know that this is going to be a little wonky because, you know, you've got a, you got a, amplifier on one end and you've got the transceiver on the other right so let's do it this way transceiver is going to be on the left okay you'll see the amplifier here on the right now i know it's hard to see it you'll hear it click it's on remote so the transceiver essentially becomes now a 1200 watt transceiver if i change modes because it's on the remote setting and the cable is connected it's going to change Listen, I won't have to say anything. You'll just be able to hear the amp change. And if you've got wonderful eyes, you can see the light, the band light up here change as well. Okay, so we'll start down at 160. You'll see it come down. And I'll give you a closer view of this here in just a second. Hear it? Now it's down at 160. 80. 60. 40. 40 and 60, same on this. Now we go up to, um, excuse me, sorry, where's that? 30 and 20. See how it all works? Everything just kind of changes for you. It's nice. 17 meters. We go to 15. And sometimes it'll use the same, uh, the same, you know, tuning. So it doesn't need to change its actual knob because it'll cover two bands. Okay. Now we go to 12 and 10. See, didn't change because it has the same the same band there. Go up to six, and there it is. So it gives you an idea, and I'm going to move this rig off of the screen so you don't have to see the rig. And it'll help you to see a better view of what this thing does and just kind of watch the little lights because we like to do that sometimes. All right, move you over to as close as I can to this um, to the amp. This is the LS1306 by Ameritron. It's about 3400 bucks, and it's probably the best 3400 I spent. I would not sell one of my transceivers. Um, I would sell a transceiver before I sold this. Guarantee it. Absolutely, I would. Next, we'll just go, we'll kind of go back to start. 160. See the light change. Watch the knob. Okay. Now we're on 80. Okay. 40. Sorry, 40 is 30. 40 is the new 30. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, here's 30 and 20. See how it changes? The light just changes. Even if you don't hear a click, it's still changing to that frequency. That's what it does automatically. And it's going to follow you. The, the advantage here is if you have an amplifier, sorry, an antenna that's already resonant, you don't have to worry because literally there's no tuning needed. You don't need the antenna tuner, but you should still use it in case, say, the wind is blowing real hard. Okay, I know wires can, they're electrical, but things can go wrong out there. Okay, you get a rush of SWR coming back. The tuner takes the rush and is built to accept that, that load coming back instead of blowing up your amplifier. Don't want to do that. That's why you always want to use a tuner before that amp. That tuner is going to protect it coming from the ampli from the antenna. So antenna, tuner, tuner, amplifier, amplifier, transceiver. Works like that. That way your SWR doesn't come down and beat up your, your uh, amplifier. Okay. Let's see. Um, Stu, sorry, it's dinner time. Good night, Stu. Enjoy. How about a good old SB220? They're good and cheap. Yes, old. You know, whatever you like, really... I simply didn't want to go back to tube. I had 811Hs here, and I love them. They're great amplifiers. I highly recommend the 811H as a starter amp. I think every ham should start with one because it teaches you how to control grid, you know, your, your grid, your plate voltage, and all that. It teaches you how to tune for the dip. It's really good. It helps you understand it. But to do a show like this, practically, I needed a solid-state switching amp because I got to move to the next frequency right away. And if I'm using the amplifier, I have to be ready. I don't have time to be on here and changing and tuning the amplifier. Alpha says, I'm sorry, uh, trucking says, love to have an Alpha 77, 90, yeah, yeah. Those are very expensive. We, I think we all would like that. Yeah, some of the Alpha amps are beautiful, very expensive. I saw an auction 
um, about two weeks ago, it was over on QRZ where there was, uh, I think it was an Alpha 97 and it was really cool, beautiful condition. Ham had just a ton of stuff and they went through this auction house to sell it because there was so much high quality gear there. Yeah. Glenn, Mtron makes a good amplifier. There you go. Very good, Glenn. Thank you very much for that. Robbie says, a general rule, I don't use ATUs or tuner. I prefer resonant antennas. That's great. I agree with you, Rob, but something goes wrong. You're using it, right? Using an amplifier and things can go wrong like wind, like rain, like a lot of things to your, I mean, antennas. I see an SWR fluctuate on verticals. I have, especially on wire antennas. So just to be safe, it's good to have that ATU there because if something does go wrong, that ATU is going to protect it. That's the whole point. So uh, let's see here. Robbie, this is great advice, by the way. Amplifier should be purchased once your antenna system has been maximized. Otherwise, you're getting out but not receiving. He's right. When you get into this hobby, build yourself or buy and tune an antenna that's resonant. You want it to be resonant because that way it works. Don't go marginal. Don't go to 2 to 1 or 2.5 to 1 and call it good. Get it down below 1.5 to 1 the best you can. If you can't, you can use that band and use a tuner for it. But man, you're just not getting the most out of your antenna. Try and get that antenna below 1.5 to 1. You'll hear the difference in gain. You will. You'll hear it and the transmit will be phenomenal. It works, it just does. So get that antenna maximized, as Robbie said, and you'll be golden. Good. Phil Daniels here, Kilo Charlie 5 Tango Mike, first time from Oklahoma. Welcome, Oklahoma City's in the house. Phil, it's an honor to have you. Thank you for coming today. Chris is here, greetings. His call sign is Kilo Indy 